Hello, and welcome back to New Scientist Weekly, the essential selection of the week's science stories. I'm Penny Sarche. And I'm Rowan Hooper. Welcome to the show. This week, we welcome back Jacob Aaron to the pod after a long absence, Jacob's New Scientist news editor. And we also have assistant news editor Sam Wong, reporter Claire Wilson, and freelance science journalist Mike Marshall. Welcome all. Hello. 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 On the show this week, we're going to hear about what a new UN report says we should do about geoengineering. And we have troubling health findings about a widely used type of sweetener. We also have perhaps the first really intriguing and important scientific finding from the James Webb Space Telescope, as it's found galaxies 30 billion light years away that are much bigger than they should be. We also have a very interesting life form of the week coming up. All that to come, but we're going to start with a story that you've done for us this week, Mike, about how viruses can trigger chronic conditions. And I think that's something that's on a lot of people's minds at the moment because of long COVID. But that's not the only long term condition that can be triggered by getting ill with a virus, is it? No, absolutely not. There's a number of conditions where viral infections are either the primary cause or at least are playing a contributing role. And I've focused on two in my story. One is uh, myalgic encephalomyelitis or chronic fatigue syndrome, MECFS, and herpes viruses are increasingly implicated as the cause of that. And I also looked at fibromyalgia, a form of chronic pain in which viruses also seem to be one of the triggers. Both of these, there's been sort of suspected roles of viruses for a while, haven't there? But there's been a kind of not necessarily that much focus on it. Am I am I right to say that with long COVID and the sheer scale of people who, who now have long COVID, that sort of changed our attitude towards these conditions? I think that's right. Yeah. I mean, even before the pandemic, there was a sort of slow growing shift in the research community, like a growing um, acceptance that there was some sort of biological, possibly viral cause for MECFS. But the COVID-19 pandemic and the advent of long COVID has really kind of supercharged that realisation because the, partly just because of the sh- yeah the sheer scale of it. So there's a, a recent review about long COVID, which gave a fairly conservative estimate that about 10% of all infections with the SARS-CoV-2 virus will lead to long COVID of some degree. And given that there have been over 750 million confirmed cases of COVID, that would imply now 75 million incidences of long COVID and the number still going up. Wow, that's huge in scale then. What's the latest on what we know about what causes long COVID? So although obviously the SARS-CoV-2 virus is, at the, is to some extent at the root of it, hmm. it seems like there are multiple different sort of pathways that can go on. So not every person with long COVID is necessarily sort of having the um, condition caused in the same way. So one thing that can happen is sort of ongoing disruption to the immune system. So like some immune chemicals like being produced at too high levels, other things being produced at too low a level and the sort of knock on effects of that. Another thing that's being looked at is microscopic blood clots, which might sort of block the smallest blood vessels, the capillaries, and the sort of cause like tissue damage and like lack of energy. There's also the possibility that some people actually have persistent coronavirus infection, so the virus lingering somewhere in their body and in, even in quite a small quantity and uh, continuing to cause damage. All of those explanations are very much in play, and it may well be that there isn't like a single long COVID as such. It's pr- it's likely that there's actually going to be several different types of it, and that depending on which type you've got, a different treatment regimen is going to be what helps you. Could that also be why there's you know there's lots of different symptoms, and some of those um, overlap with ME, chronic fatigue syndrome, don't they? Um, there's quite a, a few in common. Oh yeah, absolutely. The the overlap between long COVID and ME CFS is quite considerable so it's not that they're the same exactly the same thing because a lot of you know because long covid is also very diverse there's uh, over 200 reported symptoms and kind of every case is unique but a significant fraction of people who are diagnosed with long covid would also meet the diagnostic criteria for MECFS so that you know that thing of um, post exertional malaise where you know, even a, a small amount of exertion or exercise just triggers this crippling fatigue that can leave you in bed for days that, for instance, yeah, that's a hallmark of MECFS and it can crop up in long COVID as well. So what kind of viruses have been implicated in chronic fatigue or, or ME then? 
So there's been a number of things looked at, but I think one of the most promising leads is a herpes virus. And this is being looked at by a number of researchers, but particularly Bupesh Prusty at the University of Würzburg in Germany. So it's human beta herpes virus 6b, which is one of a number of quite common herpes viruses that most of us will get at some point in our lives. In fact, in this particular case, the vast majority of people get this particular herpes virus, HHV 6b, within the first few years of our life. And we get a mild illness that lasts a few days and we're sort of barely aware of it. But after that, the virus sticks with us. So it writes its genetic code into our DNA, into the DNA of our cells, and it stays with us for the rest of our lives. So it's Mm. likely that everyone on this podcast and the majority of the listeners actually have a bit of this virus DNA lingering somewhere in our bodies from an, uh, from an infection early in life. And for most of us, that doesn't seem to matter very much, but sometimes uh, later in life, the virus can become like reactivated due to some sort of external stressor or trigger, like for example, getting COVID or getting some other viral infection. And that reactivation is the thing that Bupesh Prusty and others are suggesting is behind MECFS. In the story that I've written, I go into the evidence for that. And we'll put a link to that in our show notes. Jacob, let's talk about the latest from the James Webb Space Telescope, because there's something really weird that they found this time. It spotted galaxies really far away. So that means they were formed quite soon after the Big Bang, after the universe was born but they're much bigger than expected. So what's going on? Yes, as you you might expect, astronomers think that when galaxies first formed soon after the birth of the universe, they'd be fairly small. It takes time for for galaxies to grow large. Mm. But James Webb has spotted galaxies much larger than we would expect at this time. So these galaxies are 30 billion light years away, (laughs) uh, and they would have formed uh, roughly... 700 million years after the Big Bang, which sounds like a long time, but, you know, in sort of galactic terms is is quite quick. And yet they have a mass of 100 billion times um, that of the sun. So suggesting that, you know, they're containing loads and loads of, of stars or, you know, yeah. stars uh, similar to the mass of the sun and just far bigger than we would have expected. So at the moment, what's our understanding of how galaxies formed? Are they, I mean, my understanding would be like a swirling mass that just sort of drags in, sucks in more matter until it just, you know, gets bigger and bigger. <laughs> is that is that anywhere near correct? Yeah, well, if you think of it in, you know, the early universe when matter first formed, it was hydrogen and helium gas. And then this started clumping together to eventually form, you know, galactic clouds of gas. And from those stars could start collapsing out and then the stars would come together. So the problem is with these galaxies, we don't think there would have been enough gas at the start of the universe for these to actually form. So one of the researchers we spoke to said, um, you know, they submitted their their paper on this work. And one of the reviewers pointed out there wasn't enough gas in the universe at this point, as far as we understand it, to form these. Um, And uh, they say that's a bit of a problem. (laughs) Yeah, I saw that. I love the understatement there. That, and I love that that's what a reviewer could say in a in a physics paper. You know, by the way, uh, there wasn't enough there wasn't enough matter for this to work in the early universe. No, but it's really actually quite spooky, isn't it? Because that doesn't mean we just haven't got galaxy formation wrong, but we've got there's something else about the entire universe that is missing that we don't know about, isn't it? That's quite it gets deeper, doesn't it? Well, I'd say this is possibly the biggest impact that James Webb has had so far. So, you know, Mm. it launched last year. We had all of these amazing pictures uh, that everyone loved to ooh and ah over. Mm. But actually, you know, some of the most exciting things were these tiny red dots, these really, really far away galaxies that people were, were seeing in the images and finding galaxies that formed so much earlier and so much larger than we expected. And at the time, people said, oh, you know, it's too, it's too early uh, in, in James Webb's life to be saying, oh, these galaxies are, are breaking the universe. <laughs> but actually, these results do seem to be standing up. That there, There's something going on in the early universe that we don't understand that is, really is going to challenge our model of how everything formed. And, and yeah, people are going to have to keep using James Webb and other telescopes. And if the evidence keeps piling up, then we've got to come up with a, a new theory. 
but that's brilliant, isn't it? That's what we want, and that's what in it. And you know, it's not just a a big a big camera to get pretty pictures for us, is it? It's a scientific instrument, and they want it to really challenge, give us challenging things like this. So it's they must be kind of yay, really happy that they. Yeah, I, I think you know, as I said, people were cautious initially, said you know, oh, maybe the instrument's got it wrong. You know, let's right. let's not overturn the universe uh, after day one. But I think the <laughs> the consensus is is coming that yeah, we've really got to have a rethink here. Okay, the universe is broken. You heard it here first. <laughs> Thank you, Jacob. Let's take a break to give a shout out to our upcoming Instant Expert Brain event. It's our first Instant Expert event this year. It takes place on Saturday, the 29th of April at the Cavendish Conference Centre in London. Topics covered will include perception, sleep, language, consciousness, memory and altered mental states. And you'll be taught by six world-class scientists who will make you an instant expert on everything about the brain. And you get lunch and it's a great social occasion. Uh, it really is a great day. Go to newscientist.com slash your brain to book your place. It's time now for Life Form of the Week. And Sam, you have a, a truly extraordinary insect to tell us about this week. Yes, uh, they're called the glassy winged sharpshooters. Um, they're a kind of leaf hopper found in North America, and they're only a few millimeters long, but they have this bizarre superpower, which is they produce so much urine that they've evolved this really unusual way of excreting it by shooting it out of their bodies in droplets, which is why they're called sharpshooters. Um, and in, in places where you've got a big population of them and they're up in the trees, they can actually make it rain. So they're a big nuisance. And wow. uh, they do a lot of damage to trees as well. Make it rain. There's so much <laughs> urine coming out. Mm. Oh, my God. I have just so many questions. Where is the urine coming from? Why do they have so much of it? So th they have so much urine because they have this really terrible diet, basically. They feed by sticking their mouth parts into xylem tissue. And xylem is the water transport system of, of plants. So it does contain some nutrients and minerals, but at very low concentrations. So the insects have to drink vast quantities of it to get enough energy to sustain themselves. So about 300 times their body weight each day. Saad Baumler at Georgia Tech, the researcher here, he said it's like drinking diet lemonade and that's, that's everything. I, as a plant scientist, this baffles me because there's another type of tube in plants that's full of sugar water. Mm. Do, do they not know that one's there? <laughs> that they've gone for the water instead. I guess that that the stickiness of the uh, the phloem is probably a, a different kind of challenge for yeah uh, yeah that. evolution mm. at its mm. best. And so then, why if they're producing this much urine? Why catapult it or throw it out? Well, can't you just let it drip away? Or yeah, scream? so I had never really thought about this before because you know when you're the size of a human, you know it's no effort at all to produce a stream of urine. But when you're really small, it's actually it takes energy to do that because you know water is quite sticky when you're a when you're mm. a tiny thing. So that that has an energy cost, and it turns out that this is a much more efficient way. So what do they do? So they have a, a hairy appendage on their rear end called an anus stylus. <laughs> And that, that rotates to open and let out a drop of fluid. But then it does this fast twist to release the droplet and fling it into the air. And the remarkable thing about that is the droplet moves 40% faster than the anal stylus. And that's a phenomenon <laughs> called super propulsion, which is very rare in engineering designs and has never been seen before in a living organism. Wow, that's amazing. And so, <laughs> dare I ask, how did they discover this? Anal catapult. They, yeah, <laughs> they discovered it by by uh, looking at a lot of these um, insects in in the lab and and doing some mathematical modelling as well. So it turns out that the key to how this this droplet is able to accelerate it's to do with the elasticity of water droplets. So it means they can store energy like a spring loading mechanism. So when the droplet is expelled, the energy is released to generate that speed. And the mathematical model suggests that this mechanism is four to eight times more efficient than if they were to produce a, a stream of fluid. It's been a long time since I saw Starship Troopers, but I definitely remember that the alien insect in that was shooting things out of their backsides with enough force to send it into orbit. And I'm fairly sure that that's the inspiration for this study. There you go. This isn't my form of the week. This is a sci-fi alert. A twist. Mm. Now, our next story is something that sounds rather alarming. Uh, it's about a kind of sweetener called erythritol. Claire, I've never heard of this, but should I have done? 
Well, you might never have heard of it, but you, you probably have eaten it unless you're someone who never has any diet drinks or any food sold as low calorie or sometimes no. low carb <laughs> carbohydrate or keto foods. No, um, I don't actually. <laughs> you don't? Okay. Well, maybe yeah. you have never had it then. Right. Erythritol is one of the more recent low calorie sweeteners to enter our diet. Now, I should say it is also found naturally in some right. fruits and um, is even also made by our own body. So it's, it's not completely artificial, but it is being used in foods and drinks now at much higher levels than are normally found. Um, so it is being used in a kind of an artificial manner and it's growing actually the amount of foods that contain it. OK, um, and what's the problem with it? Well, the concern is that it might cause blood clots and the, that these can lead to heart attacks and strokes. Mm. So might is an important word here because the case hasn't been proven yet. I think it's the first time these concerns have ever been aired. And uh, but they come from three different kinds of research. So one is studies that look at blood levels of erythritol and people's chances of having a heart attack or stroke. And there was about double the risk in the top quarter of people with that. So the, the people with the highest blood levels compared with the quarter of people who had the lowest levels. Right. So I'm sure, you know, the these kinds of studies alone are not considered a, a strong kind of medical evidence because they show correlation, but not causation, as scientists often like to say. But the same group of scientists who did these studies also did some other kinds of research. And I think altogether it, it paints a concerning picture. OK. Um, and the other research being animal studies? Yes. yes. So in right. animals, they, they show that the sweetener promotes blood clotting and then samples of human blood when you, you know, you add the sweetener to it in the same form that it is yeah. in the blood. Yeah, it becomes more sticky or liable to form clots. Yeah. Oh, and then when, when they just got healthy volunteers to just consume some typical diet foods and drinks containing the sweetener, their blood levels, you know, they're far higher than the levels that cause clotting in the animals. So, you know, you put it all together. I mean, it, it's kind of funny that this didn't show up before the thing was passed for to be in all our foods, isn't it? Yes, uh, but uh, they never did these kinds of studies no. before. <laughs> no. OK, so where does that leave us? I mean, you know, it's not that we should be, you know, avoiding this stuff, is it? Well, I think it leaves us in a bit of a, a puzzle, really, because uh, mainstream health advice from the NHS, for instance, in the UK, although it's the same in many other countries like the US and Australia, is that we should be eating less sugar. And mm. so if you like things like ice cream and or biscuits, and most of us do, I do, yeah, um, yeah. then in theory, it is better to eat the diet versions of these products that often contain sweeteners. The NHS, for instance, currently has a specific campaign for healthy eating that um, one of its, you know, it hinges on making healthy swaps. So they want you, they say, swap out your normal yogurt for one with sweeteners, swap out normal custard, for instance, for the kind with sweeteners, and drinks as well, obviously, you know, soda, there are obviously full sugar soda is seen as a complete no-no. Yeah, I mean, I suppose the, the attractive thing about this is, even though we, we're using it at artificially high levels, it is a sort of natural, in inverted commas, sweetener, right? As you said, it, it's found in our bodies normally and in fruits it is. normally. It is a natural it, product. And, it, you know, it is found in certain fruits like yeah. melon, for, you know, that lovely sweet taste of melon. But, then, you know, the, the levels in the blood that you get after drinking one can of soda, it tends to be the newer kinds of, of diet drinks, not the, right. the, the more traditional ones like it can be a thousand fold higher than what you would normally get after just kind of eating fruit and vegetables so mm -hmm. i don't think you can really say oh it's natural because no, it, sure. that's clearly a bit of a different situation from from the natural okay i mean it's not doesn't mean to say that we should you know look on the labels or, or does it you know and, and and go for a product with a, a different kind of sweetener on it yeah so that that is one obvious take home message from it or well, let's just avoid this one but the problem is only last year, a different paper came out finding that three other kinds of sweeteners, aspartame, sucralose and asulfame, were also linked with heart attacks and strokes. And I haven't <laughs> dug into that research in so much detail, but there's also been just a kind of a longer standing concern about the very principle behind trying to use artificial sweeteners is that although it might seem a very appealing thing to do to kind of trick the body in a way by giving it a sweet taste with zero calories, 
some research I've raised concerns that you just can't read, like there's no such thing as a free lunch. Yeah. There might be other unwanted effects on the metabolism. This week has seen two developments in solar geoengineering, meaning ways to reduce the amount of sunlight that gets to the planet and so counter the effect of global heating. The first development is an open letter signed by 67 researchers calling for more research on the potential methods for doing this. And the second thing this week is a new report published by the United Nations Environment Programme called One Atmosphere, an independent expert review on solar radiation modification research and deployment. Snappy. Rowan spoke with one of the authors of the UN report, Jim Hayward, who is a professor of atmospheric science at the University of Exeter. Jim, thanks for joining us. Now, the UN has assembled this big multidisciplinary team of researchers to put together this report into solar radiation modification. Let's start by explaining. Can you explain that for us? Sure. The UN report on solar radiation management is really in response to the growing realisation that hitting a sort of one and a half degree or or two degree target above pre-industrial levels in terms of the global mean temperature is going to be very hard. Uh, We're already at uh, about 1.2 degrees of warming and there's increasing evidence of uh, detrimental climate impacts. So what we also realise is that the sort of mitigation efforts um, seem to be too little too late to meet these one and a half and two degrees targets. So as scientists, a lot of us have been looking at potential other methods for artificially cooling the, the climate. So that's really what the whole science is about. How can you um, apply a, a counterbalancing cooling to the global warming that we're, we're experiencing and will experience even more in the future? So you said management, but they say modification now, don't they? Because they like to not immediately suggest that we can manage it. But what's the most likely form that this would take? Solar radiation modification, you're quite right, they they do term it that, tends to take two uh, different forms. Or there's been two forms that have been most studied in the literature at the moment. The first one is, if you like, mimicking the uh, cooling impact from large explosive volcanic eruptions. So we know from the climate records that uh, volcanoes like Pinatubo and some earlier ones and Young, El Chichon in in the climate record have all uh, led to a a cooling of climate that can be detected. And that happens because they they inject a lot of sulfur dioxide into the stratosphere, which then oxidizes to form this reflective aerosol in the stratosphere that can exist for up to three or four years. And that reflective layer of aerosols reflects sunlight back out to space, and it's not hard to see how that cools the climate. Mm. So that's the first one. That's called uh, stratospheric aerosol intervention or stratospheric aerosol injection. The second is known as marine cloud brightening, and that's really where you put a bit of additional sea salt into clouds and you can make them brighter. Again, the net impact of that is to reflect more sunlight back out to space and cool the planet. So those are the two uh, most commonly looked at forms of solar radiation modification. And they appear to be the most feasible in terms of costs, uh, efficiency, etc. But of course, we haven't really had any outdoor experiments yet, have we? And, it, and perhaps is, is that now something that we're moving towards? Yeah, I mean, a lot of the, the research so far has not looked at uh, specific outdoor experiments apart from things like, you know, volcanoes go off all the time. Um, In 2019, there was a volcano that injected 1.5 million tonnes of of sulphur dioxide into the stratosphere. That was called Rikoke. It was in the Coral Islands. We've studied that a lot. And we can see this this, uh, layer of reflective aerosols in satellite observations. And we can model that with our climate models. So we do a a bunch of those kind of simulations using natural analogues. Hmm. We do the same sort of thing for uh, marine cloud brightening. Icelandic volcanoes, there was one which went off, not, not the one that you're thinking of, Ea Fiocul, but... Um, I'm glad one, you said that. <laughs> yeah, yes, there was one called uh, Haluran that went off uh, in 2014. And that was a very different beast. That one just uh, was a fissure eruption that opened up and sulfur dioxide just spilled out of that. 
And you could see afterwards all the clouds across the, the North Atlantic all brightened up. Hmm. So there have been, you know, analogs that we've looked at. What hasn't uh, happened is any deliberate, if you like. Right. We're going to put something into the, into the stratosphere or into hmm. marine cloud brightening. One thing I saw in the summary is that this would be the only way of getting temperatures down quickly, but it would need to be deployed for several decades to centuries on that kind of scale. And I wondered where they got that scale from, because sometimes you hear it could be even longer, you know, millennial scale. Yeah, I mean, the climate change, uh, future scenarios of climate change are very variable, and it depends very much on our future mitigation strategies as to what temperature we would we would end up with in a, a non-solar radiation modification kind of world. Mm. So there's an awful lot of our future is still in our hands in terms of how much mitigation we can do. And that's definitely the primary, every person on the panel agreed that that's where our primary aim should be. But it is possible that solar radiation modification could potentially be used together with stringent emission reductions to combat the worst impacts of climate change. And Mm. that's what the panel has been recommending. Another thing that struck me from the report was that there's a line saying the consequences of a world with solar radiation modification have to be balanced against those of a world without and that feels a little bit again like it's softening us up for for it you know it's saying that it feels like it's getting around to saying the benefits outweigh the costs is am i on the right lines there with that i think what's needed is a risk risk analysis there are undoubtedly uh, some consequences of solar radiation modification you know you don't just come back to exactly the same world as as we're in now for example, if you were to apply solar radiation um, modification methods. But have a look and see what, what some of the climate scenarios are saying, you know, by the time you get to 2050, by the time you get to 2070, et cetera. Mm. And it's, it's very, very important that we, we realise that it is a risk-risk kind of assessment. What is our future climate going to look like if we keep on piling out millions and millions of tons of carbon dioxide? That's the question. And is solar radiation modification a price worth paying in order to reduce some of the the extremes that we might end up with under these climate scenarios in the future? I don't know. It still feels in the balance to me, just as an onlooker, as to whether this will ever happen or not. So I don't know if, if you can still come down on any side of what's more likely deployment or not? I don't think that I can say that. I don't think that we, I don't think that the scientific community can say that at the moment, but it is a very contentious issue, you know, and in some ways it's an admission of failure of our, our mitigation strategies. That was Jim Hayward at the University of Exeter, and we'll put a link to our story on the open letter in our show notes, as well as a link to that UN Environment Programme report. Thanks to all our guests and thanks to you for listening. Do subscribe to our show and urge everyone you know (laughs) to listen to it. (laughs) Go out and do it, please. Um, Thanks for joining us and we'll see you again soon. Bye for now. Bye. 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 This podcast is produced by OG Podcasts. Find out more at ogpodcasts.co.uk.